The Queen's 16th Birthday December 21st, four months until Beltane Greaves Drake Manor A young queen stands barefoot on a wooden block with her arms outstretched. She has only her scant underclothes and the long black hair that hangs down her back to fend off the drafts. Every ounce of strength in her slight frame is needed to keep her chin high and her shoulders square. Two tall women circle the wooden block. Their fingertips drum against crossed arms, and their footsteps echo across the cold hardwood floor. She is thin to the ribs, Genevieve says, and smacks them lightly, as if it might scare the bones farther under the skin. And still so small. Small queens do not inspire much confidence. The others on the council cannot stop whispering about it. She studies the queen with distaste, her eyes dragging across every imperfection, her hollow cheeks, her pallid skin, the scabs from a rubbing of poison oak that still mar her right hand, but no scars. They are always careful about that. Put your arms down, Genevieve says, and turns on her heel. Queen Katerine glances at Natalia, the taller and elder of the two Aaron sisters, before she does. Natalia nods, and the blood rushes back to Katerine's fingertips. She will have to wear gloves tonight, Genevieve says. Her tone is unmistakably critical. But it is Natalia who determines the queen's training. And if Natalia wants to rub Katerine's hands with poison oak one week before her birthday, then she will. Genevieve lifts a lock of Katerine's hair. Then she pulls it, hard. Katerine blinks. She has been prodded back and forth by Genevieve's hand since she stepped onto the block, jerked so roughly at times that it seems Genevieve wants her to fall so she can scold her for the bruises. Genevieve pulls her hair again. At least it is not falling out. But how can black hair be so dull? And she is still so, so small. She is the smallest and the youngest of the triplets, Natalia says, in her deep, calm voice. Some things, sister, you cannot change. When Natalia steps forward, it is difficult for Katerine to keep her eyes from following her. Natalia Aaron is as close to a mother as she will ever know. It was her silk skirt that Katerine burrowed in at the age of six, all that long way from the black cottage to her new home at Greaves Drake Manor, sobbing after being parted from her sisters. There was nothing queenly about Katerine that day, but Natalia indulged her. She let Katerine weep and ruin her dress. She stroked her hair. It is Katerine's earliest memory, the one and only time Natalia ever allowed her to act like a child. In the slanting, indirect light of the parlor, Natalia's ice blonde bun appears almost silver. But she is not old. Natalia will never be old. She has far too much work and far too many responsibilities to allow it. She is the head of the Aaron family of poisoners and the strongest member of the Black Council. She is raising their new queen. Genevieve grasps Katerine's poisoned hand. Her thumb traces the pattern of scabs until she finds a large one and picks it until it bleeds. Genevieve, Natalia cautions, that is enough. Gloves are fine, I suppose, Genevieve says, though she still seems cross. Gloves over the elbows will give shape to her arms. She releases Katerine's hand and it bounces against her hip. Katerine has been on the block for over an hour, and there is much day still ahead. All the way to nightfall, her party and the Gave Noir, the Poisoner's Feast. Just thinking of it makes her stomach clench, and she winces slightly. Natalia frowns. You have been resting? She asks. Yes, Natalia, says Katerine. Nothing but water and thinned porridge. Nothing. Nothing to eat but that for days, and it may still not be enough. The poison she will have to consume, the sheer amounts of it, may still overcome Natalia's training. Of course it would be nothing at all if Katerine's poisoner gift were strong. Standing on the block, the walls of the darkened parlor feel heavy. They press in, 
given weight by the sheer number of errands inside. They have come from all across the island for this, the Queen's 16th birthday. Greaves Drake usually feels like a great, silent cavern, empty save for Natalia and the servants. Her siblings, Genevieve and Antonin, and Natalia's cousins, Lucian and Allegra, when they are not at their houses in town. Today it is busy and decked with finery. It is packed to purpose with poisons and poisoners. If a house could smile, Greaves Drake would be grinning. She has to be ready, Genevieve says. Every corner of the island will hear about what happens tonight. Natalia cocks her head at her sister. The gesture manages to convey at once how sympathetic Natalia is to Genevieve's worries and how tired she is of hearing about them. Natalia turns to look out the window, down the hills to the capital city of Indrid Down. The twin black spires of the Volroy, the palace where the queen resides during her reign, and where the black council resides permanently, rises above the chimney smoke. Genevieve, you are too nervous. Too nervous, Genevieve asks. We are entering the ascension year with a weak queen. If we lose, I will not go back to Prin. Her sister's voice is so shrill that Natalia chuckles. Prin. It was once the poisoner's city, but now only the weakest reside there. The entire capital of Indrid Down is theirs now. It has been for over a hundred years. Genevieve, you have never even been to Prin. Do not laugh at me. Then do not be funny. I do not know what you are about sometimes. She looks again out the window, toward the Volroy's black spires. Five errands sit on the Black Council. No less than five have sat on it for three generations, placed there by the ruling Poisoner Queen. I am only telling you what you may have missed, being so often away from council business, coaching and coddling our queen. I do not miss anything, says Natalia, and Genevieve lowers her eyes. Of course, I am sorry, sister. It is only that the council grows wary, with the temple openly backing the elemental. The temple is for festival days and for praying over sick children. Natalia turns and taps Katerine beneath the chin. For everything else, the people look to the council. Why do you not go out to the stables and ride, Genevieve? She suggests. It will settle your nerves. Or return to the Volroy. Some business there is sure to require attention. Genevieve closes her mouth. For a moment, it seems that she might disobey or reach up toward the block and slap Katerine across the face, just to relieve her tension. That is a good idea, Genevieve says. I will see you tonight then, sister. After Genevieve has gone, Natalia nods to Katerine. You may get down. The skinny girl's knees shake as she climbs off the block, careful not to stumble. Go to your rooms, Natalia says, and turns away to study a sheaf of papers on a table. I will send Giselle with a bowl of porridge, then nothing else besides a few sips of water. Katerine bows her head and drops half a curtsy for Natalia to catch from the corner of her eye. But she lingers. Is it? Katerine asks. Is it really as bad as Genevieve says? Natalia regards her a moment, as though deciding whether she will bother to answer. Genevieve worries, she says finally. She has been that way since we were children. No, Cat, it is not so bad as all that. She reaches out to tuck some strands of hair behind the girl's ear. Natalia often does that when she is pleased. Poisoner queens have sat the throne since long before I was born. They will sit it long after you and I are both dead. She rests her hands on Katerine's shoulders. Tall, coldly beautiful Natalia. The words from her mouth leave no room for arguments, no space for doubt. If Katerine were more like her, the errands would have nothing to fear. Tonight is a party, says Natalia, for you on your birthday. Enjoy it, Queen Katerine, and let me worry about the rest. Seated before her dressing mirror, Queen Katerine studies her reflection as Giselle brushes out her black hair in long, even strokes. Katerine is still in her robe and underclothes and is still cold. Greavesdrake is a drafty place that clings to its shadows. Sometimes it seems that she has spent most of her life in the dark and chilled to the bone. 
On the right side of her tableau is a glass-sided cage. In it, her coral snake rests, fat with crickets. Katerina's had her since she was a hatchling, and she is the only venomed creature Katerine does not fear. She knows the vibrations of Katerine's voice and the scent of her skin. She has never bitten her, even once. Katerine will wear her to the party tonight, coiled around her wrist like a warm, muscular bracelet. Natalia will wear a black mamba. A small snake bracelet is not as fancy as one draped across one's shoulders, but Katerine prefers her little adornment. She is prettier, red and yellow and black, toxic colors, they say, the perfect accessory for a poisoner queen. Katerine touches the glass and the snake lifts her rounded head. Katerine was instructed to never give her a name, told over and over that she was not a pet. But in Katerine's head, she calls the snake sweetheart. Don't drink too much champagne, Giselle says, as she gathers Katerine's hair into sections. It is sure to be envenomed or stained with poison juice. I heard talk in the kitchen of pink mistletoe berries. I will have to drink some of it, says Katerine. They are toasting my birthday, after all. Her birthday and her sister's birthdays. All across the island, the people are celebrating the 16th birthday of the newest generation of triplet queens. Wet your lips, then, says Giselle. Nothing more. It is not only the poison to be mindful of, but the drink itself. You are too slight to handle much without turning sloppy. Giselle weaves Katerine's hair into braids and twists them high upon the back of her head, wrapping them around and around into a bun. Her touch is gentle. She does not tug. She knows that the years of poisoning have weakened the scalp. Katerine reaches for more makeup, but Giselle clucks her tongue. The queen is already powdered too white, an attempt to hide the bones that jut from her shoulders and to disguise the hollows in her cheeks. She has been poisoned thin. Nights of sweating and vomiting have made her skin fragile and translucent as wet paper. You are pretty enough already, Giselle says, and smiles into the mirror with those big, dark doll's eyes. Giselle is kind, her favorite of the Greaves Drake's maids. But even the maid is more beautiful than the queen in many ways, with full hips and color in her face, blonde hair that shines, even though she has to dye it the ice blonde that Natalia prefers. Doll's eyes, Katerine repeats. Perhaps, but they are not lovely. They are big, black orbs in a sickly visage. Looking into the mirror, she imagines her body in pieces, bones, skin, not enough blood. It would not take much to break her down to nothing, to strip away scant muscles and pull the organs out to dry in the sun. She wonders often whether her sisters would break down similarly, if underneath their skin they are all the same. Not one poisoner, one naturalist, and one elemental. Genevieve thinks that I will fail, Katerine says. She says I am too small and weak. You are a poisoner, queen, says Giselle. What else matters but that? Besides, you are not so small, not so weak. I have seen both weaker and smaller. Natalia sweeps into the room in a tight black sheath. They should have heard her coming, heels clicking against the floors and ringing off the high ceilings. They were too distracted. Is she ready? Natalia asks, and Katerine stands. Being dressed by the head of the Aaron household is an honor, reserved for festival days and the most important of birthdays. Giselle fetches Katerine's gown. It is black and full-skirted, heavy. There are no sleeves, but black satin gloves to cover the poison oak scabs have already been laid out. Katerine steps into the gown, and Natalia begins to fasten it. Katerine's stomach quivers. Sounds of the party assembling have begun to trickle up the stairs. Natalia and Giselle slide the gloves onto her hands. Giselle opens the snake's cage. Katerine fishes out Sweetheart, and the snake coils obediently around her wrist. Is it drugged? Natalia asks. Perhaps it should be. She will be fine, Katerine says, and strokes Sweetheart's scales. She is well-mannered. As you say. Natalia turns Katerine to the mirror and places her hands on her shoulders. Never before have three queens of the same gift ruled in succession. Sylvia, 
Nicola, and Camille were the last three. All were poisoners raised by Aaron's. One more, and perhaps it will become a dynasty. Perhaps only the poisoner queen will be allowed to grow up, and her sisters will be drowned at birth. There will be nothing too surprising in the Gave Noir, Natali says. Nothing that you have not seen before. But just the same, do not eat too much. Use your tricks. Do as we practiced. It would be a good omen, Katerine says softly. If my gift were to come tonight, on my birthday, like Queen Hadley's did. You have been lingering in the library histories again. Natalia sprays a bit of jasmine perfume onto Katerine's neck and then touches the braids piled onto the back of her head. Natalia's ice blonde hair is fashioned in a similar style perhaps as a show of solidarity. Queen Hadley was not a poisoner. She had the war gift. It is different. Katerine nods as she is turned left and right, less a person than a mannequin, rough clay upon which Natalia can work her poison craft. You are a little skinny, Natalia says. Camille was never skinny. She was almost plump. She looked forward to the Gave Noir as a child to a festival feast. Katerine's ears prick at the mention of Queen Camille. Despite being raised as Camille's foster sister, Natalia almost never talks about the previous queen, Katerine's mother, though Katerine does not think of her that way. Temple doctrine decrees that queens have no mother or father. They are daughters of the goddess only. Besides, Queen Camille departed the island with her king consort as soon as she recovered from giving birth, as all queens do. The goddess sent the new queens, and the old queen's reign was ended. Still, Katerine enjoys hearing stories about those who came before. The only story about Camille that Natalia tells is the story of how Camille took her crown, how she poisoned her sisters so slyly and quietly that it took them days to die, how when it was over, they looked so peaceful that had it not been for the froth at their lips, you would have thought they had died in their sleep. Natalia saw those peaceful, poisoned faces for herself. If Katerine is successful, she will see two more. You are like Camille, though in other ways, Natalia says and sighs. She loved those dusty books in the library too, and she always seemed so young. She was so young. She only ruled for 16 years after she was crowned. The goddess sent her triplets early. Queen Camille's triplets were sent early because she was weak. That is what the people whisper. Katerine wonders sometimes how long she will have, how many years she will guide her people before the goddess sees fit to replace her. She supposes that the Aarons do not care. The Black Council rules the island in the interim, and as long as she is crowned, they will still control it. Camille was like a little sister to me, I suppose, Natalia says. Does that make me your niece? Natalia grips her chin. Do not be so sentimental, she says, and lets Katerine go. For seeming so young, Camille killed her sisters with poise. She was always a very good poisoner. Her gift showed early. Katerine frowns. One of her own triplets had showed an early gift as well. Mirabella, the great elemental. I will kill my sisters just as easily, Natalia. Katerine says, I promise, though perhaps when I am finished, they will not look like they are sleeping. Hi, I'm Kendara Blake, author of the Three Dark Crown series. Thank you so much for watching. For more videos, click here, and to subscribe to Epic Reads, click here.